So, uh, I'm Chris Peng. I am with DriveThruRPG, the world's largest RPG download store. Uh, we also have DriveThruCards, DriveThruFiction, and associated websites. I work in publisher services, which means I work directly with publishers. Uh, anyone making a game, any module, whether it just be electronic, printed on hand, whatever. Uh, if you're a brand new publisher, congratulate if you, or if you haven't signed up, or if you have signed up and you haven't published anything, or you just have one or two things, I'm your publisher services right now. Uh, I deal with literally the over a thousand small publishers that are of those categories, as well as some of the bigger ones you've probably heard of. But more importantly, especially at a convention like this, I work with the small people uh, who are doing RPG specifically. So, uh, all right, and my name is Fernando Aragon. I launched my first Kickstarter game in 2016, and then uh, followed it up with a standalone expansion in 2017. Um, I'm here pretty much to talk about lessons learned, and uh, and really you can read. I guess the, if there's anything that you guys take away from this, uh, I think this is the most important thing. If you're planning on launching a Kickstarter, you can read, read, read tons of articles and do your research, but the most valuable um, resource is like panels, learning from uh, learning from people who went through it. There's a lot of lessons learned. There's all right, cool, I did this well, but then there's Oh man, I will never do this again. You know, there's certain aspects of lessons learned. Um, just a little bit about why I kickstarted. Um, I had a unique idea, so I went to uh, George State University. I was an English major, theater minor, loved Shakespeare, and then I, I'm a big gamer and gaming for a long time. And I was like, what if I create a Shakespeare game with a card game? with Shakespearean insults, and let's, let's give it a whirl, you know, so for, you know, we'll get into details on that, but that's Steal the Show, that's the game over there, and uh, you know, the promo cards, and, and I, I must say I was happy to see um, Chris here because I, I use drive through quite a bit throughout the process. So. So tell us a little bit about yourselves. Um, my name is Anna, and I haven't created any games, so this is like my first foyer Hey, they don't all do. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so you guys are really more passionate fans and want a little bit of a peek into how the industry works. Yeah, that's cool. So, what, what we may end up doing then is we'll talk about crowdfunding and the Kickstarter experience and other crowdfunding, but we'll also talk a little bit. Well, well maybe we'll just pull back the curtain and tell some war stories since you guys are interested in like games production itself. Uh, so, we'll, we'll probably veer off the official title of the topic a little bit. To, to answer more of what, what you're interested in learning about. Yeah. Um, so uh, so I have done a little bit of game freelancing personally, um, but uh, why don't we talk a little bit, since you're more interested, before the Kickstarter starts, when the game design process first begins, why don't you talk to us a little bit about like what that looks like in your experience of it? Yeah, so and it starts off with an idea. Um, and like I said, it was the, the love of Shakespeare and gaming. And when I came up with the idea, there was um, one huge thing. I was like, if, this, if I'm going to uh, crowdfund this and I'm going to launch it on Kickstarter, it has to appeal um, to gamers and uh, theater. And um, so in the playtesting process, I was like, okay, this is a great idea, and I have theater buddies, and I'm like, all right, so I'm going to run this by them, and I was like, ooh, wait a second, I, I need gamers who can playtest playtest as well. So with my playtesting sessions, when things were just playing cards with Sharpie written over it, which I highly recommend when you're starting, um, I made sure to have a group of uh, hardcore gamers, and you have card game, like magic players were just into it, right? They love like breaking things and combos, but then I also included uh, non-gamers who may be, you know, theater nerds, and then people who really don't care for Shakespeare or games, and those would be in our pods. Um, so that was important to me before even taking it to Kickstarter. 
is I want to appeal to um, different different groups. Um, see that, so that's the idea stage. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. So you have the idea. Yeah. But then you have. Uh, in an RPG, we would definitely call it the writing stage. Um, in a card game, obviously, there's the, the writing happens in perhaps a rule book, but also on those cards, on those, on yes. those maybe three by five cards. Maybe uh, you can also order blank playing cards online. Uh, that what they're just like they look like a normal deck of playing cards, but you flip them over and there's there's no hearts or whatever you need to write on them, uh, and whatnot. Uh, I, I know some people who use those specifically because they like the feel and the, the form format of a uh, that card rather than having the sleeve paper that they cut out and whatnot. You know, um, so you know that's that's more what card development looks like in uh, in an RPG. It looks more like right like like novel. You know, you're you're sitting there and you're writing uh, and you have to commit to that idea. And sometimes you figure out it was a bad idea. Um, yeah, but uh, and, and that's fair too. There was. Uh, there was now, Steal the Show, it's just cards, and that's the way it went on uh, Kickstarter. Initially, I was trying to do too much like, in the playtesting process, and oh, man. I, I love my brother, because he's the one who, when we were bouncing ideas back, we had dice, and we were trying to like make things you know, work, and it was just too complicated. Um, and it's the playtesting stage where, um, you know, there's something about putting paper, like, you know, so you have the cards, you write Sharpie. That's what I did first, right? And then I printed out sheets of paper, put them in sleeves with playing cards. What I found to be most effective in getting people interested in playtesting, because what I would do is go to gaming stores and say, hey guys, you want to demo this? Was, again, going through drive through and I'm, I'm not just you know catering to him. I'm serious. I was excited when he was here because I, I went through uh, drive through uh, with the, the process, even what you see on Kickstarter, like the, the demos, the videos, it was uh, quality of, of drive through But what I found to get uh, playtesters that were very engaged was having some art already, having it printed, because you can have things printed through drive through that are not are not perfect yet. So the templates, it was uh, I was learning um, InDesign throughout the process because I saw the, the instructions were for InDesign, so I you know learned that, and then created some you know boxy templates and then slapped on some art. And during the demo process, people were like, you know what? I demoed a lot of people's games, their ideas, but this just feels real. And I'm like, yeah, because they're you know they're real cards, you know. Um, so I would say that when you're you're in that playtesting phase. If you have the opportunity, and it's, it's very affordable, drive through. Um, if you have that opportunity to just you know print something out, and the turnaround is very quick. It's about a week, in, I guess, in my experience. And yeah, and then after the demo, you can you know here go ahead and take a playtest card, playtest card. You know, look out on Kickstarter. You know, this summer. So so yeah, and so part of that playtesting phase, there's playtesting where it's just you and your closest associates. You mentioned your brother, right? Uh, I would never let my brother play test anything. Uh, he's, he's not really a, a gamer per se. I guess I would use him as a like if you're a non-gamer. Yeah. Like what would you? But I do have a set of friends and whatnot who uh, would be friendly. But play testing for strangers. Yeah. Like putting it in front of people who you don't know who will feel free to be brutally honest because they don't have to see you at Thanksgiving. Right. Um, <laughs> they, yeah. Um, like there's a different kind of honesty from strangers than there is from from your family members who are trying to be honest, yeah. you know. And they maybe they are in their head, you know. But there's still a certain amount of they know you and, and whatnot. But, and, um, and if you don't mind, uh, just piggyback on that. One thing that I found effective, and when I started, this is a lesson learned too. When I was um, demoing at game stores, I'm telling everybody, okay, this is how you play, this is how you play, this is how you play, and I was like, oh, okay, cool. And then there was one day where I had a friend, like, hey, I'm going to demo, and then if you could demo, um, you know, let's go ahead and get this going. And he didn't do a great job explaining things. And all, it was the, the gamers were not engaged. So that was like, you know what? I need to go ahead, and even if it's just a sheet of paper, have some rules together. And then in the playtest process, not really say anything. Like, you guys want to demo? Great. Here's the rules. 
and go ahead and, and play. Because you know, real world situation, somebody's going to buy a game, they're going to crack open the, uh, the box, look at the rules, and then they're going to play. So you want it to make sense from that point of view. I had some great feedback on um, mechanics and, ooh, this isn't clear on how this works, this works. Now, if I was you know, um, playing with them, I'm like, oh, it works this way, it works this way, it works this way. Having it on paper is what's effective. Um, so I would recommend that too. And again, strangers not being involved with the process. I have some friends who, um, uh, you know, they live across the country and they would take it to their local gaming stores and say, hey guys, play this, here are the rules, and get feedback from people who don't know me. Um, so that was valuable feedback as well. Yeah, I, uh, if at all possible, you get people to run the game who are not you. Uh, in the case of an RPG, somebody being the GM who's not you, in the case of a card game, handing it to people like, here's the rules, uh, see what you do with it. Um, uh, I know I was a, uh, a play tester for first edition Exalted uh, back in the day, and uh, some of the stuff that I gave feedback on was very different from what other groups had. Uh, one of the things that I said at the time was, uh, like, like, sort of like, oh, I get what you do on a macro scale, on like the big, like, we're going to challenge the power structures and these agreements are going to be our big bad guys. I'm like, what, what happens with, like, what do you actually do day to day? Like, you, wake, you don't wake up and be like, very well, time to take down the empire. Like, you know, <laughs> that's not. Yeah, well, <laughs> you're like, you wake up, like, what do you do day to day? Do you, are you, like, what's it like in the day in the life? Of the, so there's a whole sidebar in First Edition Exalted that's just straight up a response to some of my feedback of the day in the life of an Exalted. Um, because as much as they had an idea originally when they were developing that game about the story, you know, the epic conflicts and the whatnot, like, uh, the way I personally run games involves a lot of humanity and involves a lot of the new life, the minutia of, of life, and that's because I've had, part of that's my, the nature of the players that I tend to run with. I have a lot of different tables and groups that I play with, and one of those tables, you know, this wasn't the exalted one, but we spent a whole session where all they did was have breakfast, then look for some clues, and then have lunch. And like two, and like two out of the three hours were mealtime and specifically deciding what they were eating, because that's what they were interested in. They were exploring the space of the unique world that they were in, and that's how they really felt like doing it that day. I guess everyone was hungry, but we should have ordered pizza. That's the lesson. But uh, yeah. Oh, but, pizza. Yes, bribery. That's bribery how, people. That, that's how you get people to your house to play test. Hey guys, free pizza. You know, free food. <laughs> it's, the, it's the universal currency. Yeah, um, exactly. And some beer and really are honest. <laughs> exactly, in vino veritas. Um, but, uh, so yeah, so you've got, you're writing, you're playtesting, and in part of the playtesting, sometimes you want to be doing two things at the same time. Uh, so playtesting, you're not just looking for feedback on your game. You're building a fan base. You know, you're, that's another reason to talk to strangers. Yes, you know, your siblings are going to give money to your Kickstarter because they support you and they love you and whatnot, but you want strangers' money. That's the money you want. Uh, because those strangers show that your idea has, has legs beyond your small circle. And it's all well and good to have your house rules and the game that you've been running for years that your players are into, cool. But if that game should be published, it needs to have a wider acceptance. It needs to be an idea that doesn't exist in the world right now and has a niche to fill. Uh, I can't remember who said it, I think a lot of authors have said this actually, and that, that I've heard in the days, but a lot of people saying, why do you write novels you know, to authors? And what often they will say is, I write because the things that I wanted to read were not on the shelf. I ran out of books in the genre or the you know, sort of question about humanity that I wanted to contemplate, and I just couldn't find what I was looking for. Like, I didn't have... There were no steampunk mecha novels, and I wanted the steampunk mecha novel. And and so Shakespeare oh, card game doesn't exist. Shakespeare card like you're looking for a thing, and the yeah. thing doesn't exist. So you create the thing, you yeah. fill the niche. Uh, so I would say another important part about this is research your industry. Yes. Research what exists out there already. If there are 
five steampunk mecha novels already. How is yours different? How is, how is, you know, if you're like, like, I mean, for instance, if you want to talk about, say, the most saturated portion of the RPG market, fantasy. Fantasy is the best seller, but it's also got the widest variety of products, you know? So, for instance, if you were like, you know what, I love Conan the Barbarian, I want my own Conan the Barbarian role-playing game, I would say, cool, how's that different from the actual Conan the Barbarian role-playing game? Like, what is it about your game that is different from what we have already that people would say, well, this is different enough, uh, you know, Shakespeare card game, cool, we didn't have one before. Right. Um, what? You don't, yeah, go ahead, please, because I'll forget. You, you mentioned about the, the niche, and you do want it to appeal to more than just your family and friends. Now, I was in a, um, a fortunate situation where within 24 hours, I got the Kickstarter staff pick, and that gave, and if, if you can get that, and there, there's really not a formula to get that. Um, Humans do it, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but it stands out. To me, I, I believe it was the art. People say, oh, it's probably because of the art. So I was in a fortunate situation on my first Kickstarter um, where I was constantly near the top and I was getting views from people who and were my family and friends. And the majority of uh, the funding came from non-family and friends. And so I was very fortunate in that, uh, in that aspect. And then that, you know, I was able to then carry over those those gamers into the standalone expansion, um, but yeah, yeah. It's, so, so you've yeah. hit on a couple things that I'd like us to get to yeah. eventually, which is once you're in the Kickstarter, what how it's run, and yeah. like the follow-up Kickstarter and whatnot. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about game development. Okay, you play tested, you've got strangers to play it, you've got some legs. Maybe you even paid for some art. You found an artist you really like uh, that's engaging, and you're like, yes, this right here. This is what this, the scheme. I'm gonna just keep saying steampunk mecha, so I don't have to come up with a new thing every time. Um, it was like this is what I want my steampunk mechas to look like in my in my game, whether it be RPG or card or whatever. This is it. This is my vision. And uh, and you, you've done your market research, and now it's time to launch the Kickstarter. So what do you do for the Kickstarter? So all this development. Are there anything left before you do the Kickstarter? I'm, so yes, both, yes, most are. important thing. Budget, budget, and that even goes to the playtesting phase. When you're playtesting, you want to keep in mind how much are each of these components going to cost. Like when I was thinking about the dice aspect, all right, including dice in the package, that that's more, you know, that's a it's going to be a heavier cost there. Um, so budget is number one, and then once you figure out the budget, you want to have some art, and you want the art to be stellar. And people ask me, where you know these are great artists. Where did you find them? Well, I you know there's multiple games. I use Gunship Revolution pretty uh, heavily, and there's a lot of games that I've played and seen where their art, is, you know, it says illustrated by Gunship Revolution. So how do you get the art? Well, we contact them and say, hey, I'm interested in purchasing some art. You know, work for hire. You know, what are your rates? And then you know you go from there. So before the Kickstarter budget, research, and, yeah, research. Yeah, and uh, printing, you know, of course, as well. And because a lot of people think that with Kickstarter, okay, I have this idea, and if I raise my money, then whoop, there we go, I'm good. No, there's uh, there's a lot to it. Um, and in art, I know we we uh, touched on that a bit. In order to get your Kickstarter to stand out, even if you don't have all the art complete for your game, you want to have some, so you can say. Hey, this because um, it's also people understand with Kickstarter that it's not a finished product. You know, it's close, uh, but to show, hey, I have five pieces of art, I have five characters. This is what they look like. You can show the full art, and um, you know, throughout funding, you know, when this, once the game is funding, I'm going to have six more pieces of art. Um, so that's an important aspect. Budgeting, I think, is the most important. Um, and time. Do you have the time within that 30-day period of the Kickstarter? Um, to get on the roller coaster, and we may touch on that too. It's right. it's a roller coaster, you know, the whole process of get backers, they drop, and um, you get questions and, and all that. Right. So roller so, coaster of emotions. Right. So you don't want during your Kickstarter to surprise yourself. Your backers may surprise you, and you try to plan ahead for that. Like you want to make sure to say there's everything in the FAQ. 
but there's going to be somebody who surprises you. But you don't want to surprise yourself. You don't want to be two weeks into a three-week Head Start and be like, you know what? New stretch goal. I'm going to write a whole novel set in my world. Don't do that. Um, you want to have plan. Okay, week one, this is what I'm going to release. You know, if it's an RPG, I'm going to release my character creation chapter. Week two, I'm going to release, you know, a big set. Week three, I'm going to release my core mechanics. That kind of thing. You want to have that written ahead of time. You want to have little things that you can dole out. You don't necessarily want to wave the banner that it's coming, but you just want to like trickle it out there to keep people fan engagement. But you want to have be ready. You want to have a plan. Speaking of plan, in terms of the roller coaster, uh, there's a Kickstarter going on right now uh, for Capers. You may have seen a sign for it out on the registration table. The creator, Craig Campbell, is here. Uh, Craig, and I think I saw his list when he posted it on Facebook or something like that. He's going to be on like 10 different podcasts in the space of three weeks while the Kickstarter is going. Uh, he is going, and this includes, that's his personal appearances. <laughs> on top of that, there's a podcast called the One Shots Podcast. There's other podcasts where he's not on it, but he's convinced them to play his game on their podcast while his Kickstarter is going on. So he has this pre-planned, pre-loaded media blitz to get the word out to people. But none of that happened on accident. None of that was people, he launched his Kickstarter and people contacted him. He networked, he talked to people, he got in touch with podcasts and said, hey, I've already published games and successfully Kickstarter. You know, obviously it's a little harder if you haven't successfully published anything before, but he did, he did as much as he could with his first Kickstarter. Uh, murders and acquisitions, which is like boardroom politics, but you actually kill each other. Um, uh, yeah, go, yeah, oh, please. So, and that, that was a huge lesson learned for me. Jumping into the Kickstarter, I didn't have any reviews. And part of that is, I don't think I was aggressive enough. I was reaching out to some podcasts. And um, again, first time. Uh, kick, you know, Kickstarter developer. I would say that there's some hesitancy of, you know, do we really want to, you know, put you on there? Now, um, the second game was a lot smoother because it's like, all right, this guy already has one under his belt. It was successful, uh, but a huge and you fulfilled run. and fulfilled and quickly. I was ahead of schedule. That was another thing. So um, you mentioned, you know, no. Yeah, tell no people surprises. six months when you expect free. <laughs> there you go. Because and. And the reason for that, and it's not just to be like, okay, I'm gonna, you know, give myself a buffer and then I'm gonna deliver early. Of course, you can want that, but then things happen, um, and maybe we'll, we'll we'll have enough time to get into um, the printing piece, um, where there's things that um, are not in your control, and even I, I know that there's some. Uh, some horror stories in terms of shipping overseas, getting stuck at customs. From um, Brexit. Right. So I, I was like, okay, you know what? I don't care if it runs into my margins. I'm going to print domestically, um, you know, in the United States. And even with that, you know, there, there's hiccups, you know. So um, and just to touch on, you mentioned the stretch goals. You don't want to surprise yourself. I would say, in talking with other people who launched Kickstarters, and I'm guilty of this on the second one. You don't want to get funded, well, you want to get funded quickly, don't get me wrong, but when you get funded, you don't want to say, oh, you know what, let me go ahead and start adding stretch goals without necessarily planning them, because then you have the risk of overreaching, and then it's like, oh, wait a second, did I factor this into the budget? Don't get caught in your own hype machine. There you go. And so that's a huge lesson learned there. So you want to have those stretch goals planned out. The next Kickstarter. Uh, that I launch is going to be, again, you don't have to announce it to the world just yet, but have that plan that now we've hit this, this is the next stretch goal, and you've already uh, budgeted that in, in your game plan. Yeah. So, yeah, there's just, there's so much of the Kickstarter is you, uh, so let's, uh, we've transitioned a little bit, so now you've got a game plan, you've got advertising, the game's been developed, it's been written, you've got some art, everything's preloaded, now you have to actually set up a Kickstarter. So there's a few things you're going to have to, to set up for. So for instance, uh, here's some actual numbers for Kickstarter. Game, uh, only if you have a video at the top of your Kickstarter, only 2% of people are going to watch it. Not even to the end, 2% will even click on it. However, projects that don't have a video make 20% less money than projects that do. 
Whether or not you have a video is a signal of professionalism. The video can be terrible. It can just be, it starts with your logo, and then it's just you talking with Mike like, hey, this is Chris here. I love steampunk methods. I'm going to take two action figures and have them crash. This is what it's going to be like to play the game. Like, you could do that. And only two percent of people are going to look at it. But but my yeah. but people were like, he's so enthusiastic. Like, <laughs> my, my first video was that. <laughs> I, all right, so uh, first of all, uh, when, and I guess this is just economy of, of words, right? You don't want your video to be longer than a minute. And I don't know if there's a statistic for this. But you don't want it to be long. Yeah, if, you, if somebody clicks, you want them to watch it all the way through. You want the, I think the percentage I hit was maybe like 55% saw it through, and it was a one minute. I don't know the percentages, but I do right. know that people who watch all the way through to a video are way more likely to back. Yeah. And this space, I think just sit the video to get it. Right, but if you, if you have a 60 minute video, yeah, you are not going so uh, my first video, and again, I was fortunate to get that Kickstarter staff pick within 24 hours. My, for the first seven days, I think it was seven days, maybe it was five days, but my video consisted of just enthusiastic me talking about Shakespeare card game, you know, I'm passionate about this, you know, and, and really that works on Kickstarter, um, definitely when it comes to um, music, for example, like you know, artists who you know are working towards their their CD or um, theater groups. I, I support a lot of theater groups on, on Kickstarter. Uh, they're passionate about this play that they're going to run. So I was like, okay, I don't have a game yet. I need to get this going. And you know, I'm you know, you want to dive in at some point. You know, you can't you know stay on, on the fence. So so yeah, I you know my first video um, was just. Just me again, tapping into the okay. Well, people who are watching their you know CDs do this. So if people can see I'm passionate about it, maybe that you know will work. And then I was like, okay, you know what? I need to go ahead and for put some the logo. People, and yeah, for some people that passion is what they're yeah, looking for. Exactly. They're looking for a creator who's not just trying to cash in on like they've yes. done all the search engine optimization. It's like ah yes, if I put this and this together, it gets lots of search engine. So I should make a game about that. They want passion. Um, so that's, that's part of it. You gotta have a video. You wanna, oh, we have a question? Well, actually it's a statement. Um, when, <clears throat> in my experience, uh, if, the, if you do a video, which I highly recommend that you do, uh, make sure that people know what the hell it is. Because if you watch a video and you're kind of like, oh, is it a TV show, is it a game, is it a card right. game? Yeah, what the hell is yeah, it? Yeah, obviously you wanna communicate in your video. <laughs> but, uh, and categorize but, it correctly. Yeah. And make sure um, you, yeah. So, so another thing, some people come in, and this is a mistake I've seen happen, where they're like, oh, well, I have this personal account where I backed like a hundred Kickstarters, but uh, I don't want to look unprofessional. I'm going to create a company account for my Kickstarter. This is actually a mistake. Because of the nature of the, there is a Kickstarter community. And the Kickstarter community prefers it when you are part of the community and they see that you have backed projects. So if I were to personally ever create a Kickstarter, it would absolutely be on my personal account because then they can look at me as the creator and say, oh, Chris has backed like 100 different projects. Yeah. He's one of us. He's part of the Kickstarter and he believes in crowdfunding. Yeah, there's so many people on Kickstarter who are not creators themselves, but they want to know that you're part of the people who will help creators. Or they're creators themselves and they want to know that you're not just there to cash in, you're there to help other people too. When you see Onyx Path is one of the biggest role-playing game companies in there, and when you see who created this, it's not created by Onyx Path, it's created by Rich Thomas, who's the owner of Onyx Path, and if you click on him personally, you'll see how many hundreds of Kickstarters he's personally backed. Yeah. Um, and for the Kickstarter community, that's huge. For the people who are, the, and I'll tell you right now, there is like a baseline level of like RPG and card game Kickstarter people who kickstart so many things. Yeah. Um, I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, and, um, yeah. Like, and many, and very often they, with a new creator, if you've never had a project before, they want to see that you've <coughs> backed other people, that you yourself believe in crowdfunding, you're not just here for the money. Uh, that's sort of the attitude. And um, that's a great point. I mean, I honestly, I believe that genuinely people want to help other people, especially with their creative pursuits. Uh, I guess I was, I joined Kickstarter, I think it maybe it was six years before 
Um, you know, I even launched my game. When I joined, I didn't think I was ever going to launch a Kickstarter. But I thought it was neat what, you know, whether you're making a music CD, a game, you know, a video game, um, you know, a short movie. I was, you know, this is neat. This person is stepping out there, and it's, it's very, you know, uh, it's an emotional thing when you put a creative, uh, something creative out to the world, you know, and so, and, and like, uh, you know, it's, it's the, you, again, the community. When, I, I back a lot of uh, projects, but one of the first things I do look at is how many uh, projects has this person backed. And, um, and I'm more likely to back someone's first um, Kickstarter if they've already, you know, continually back other projects. And you can even see how far back they've been doing it. So it's like, okay, did this person launch their Kickstarter and then a month ago, you know, uh, you know back you know, 30 things? Um, but, you know, I, it, it's not going to stop me from backing someone, but again, um, it'll make it more likely. Yeah. So uh, another thing to bear in mind, uh, it's important. So I was, I'm going to tell a story of a Kickstarter that almost failed uh, that I was involved in a couple of years ago. Uh, so this is before I worked in the RPG industry. Uh, um, and one of the things that uh, I'm so I have a lot of friends with and I occasionally volunteer with is actually a podcast. Uh, there's this uh, podcast group called the Escape Artist Network. They do various speculative fiction podcasts. So they have Super Pod Horror, Podcast for Fantasy, Escape Pod for Science Fiction. I'm largely involved with their Cast of Wonders, which is a young adult fiction. It's all of those. They're really young adult focus. Um, but I, I'm a fan of all of the podcasts. And Pseudopod, the horror podcast, was having a Kickstarter. Well, the point of the Kickstarter was basically for them to keep doing what they're doing, which is run horror fiction, but they want to pay the authors a professional rate. They ideally would like to start paying their narrators, paying the editorial staff, that kind of thing. And they had cool stuff. They were like, oh, you get these stickers, and you get this tiki mug, and you know, da da da. Um, but when they were planning it, they made some mistakes. First of all, they didn't have a video. Um, didn't have a video. Um, and second of all, they set their minimum too high because they were thinking, with this Kickstarter, we don't just want to pay our authors for the next year. We also want to pay our narrators, we want to pay our editors, and we like, oh, okay, okay. What they should have done, and uh, we had a, I have this other friend who's a very good Kickstarter, he's Kickstarter multiple projects, fulfilled very successfully. I recently became, was a collaborator with them, that's another story. But the point is, he gave them advice, they didn't follow it, which is, set your minimum lower. Set your, what they should have done is they should have set their minimum at pay the authors. Pay the authors a professional rate for the number of podcasts that we have delivered in the past. You know we can deliver because we've been doing this for years. We will deliver that podcast. Uh, but what we want is, and if they had set it lower, they would have hit their minimum faster, which gets you more traffic on Kickstarter. It's a bragging right of like, we funded in less than 24 hours and that kind of thing. As it was, it took them two weeks to get their minimum funding out of a four week campaign. Uh, that was rough. It meant that they didn't have time left in the Kickstarter to push to hit stretch goals. Because they hit, and, uh, and I'll tell you right now, here's another thing. Part of why it took two weeks, it took a long time for them to get that video out. They added the video, 24 hours later they finished funding after they added the video. Because the perception of the project had changed. They should have had the video at launch. They should have set their minimum lower so they could brag about hitting their minimum. And then make a stretch goal, we pay our editors. Make a stretch goal, we pay our narrators, that kind of thing. Um, well, that's what they should have done. Uh, and they said, oh, at this level, if you back at this level, if we hit this stretch goal, then you get a tiki mug, rather than you will definitely get a tiki mug at this level. Because because they invested in that tiki mug business, that meant, then they said, we will absolutely do it no matter what, if we hit our minimum. That meant they had to set their minimum high. Um, the bragging rights of hitting your minimum as fast as you can are huge in Kickstarter, and it, it, it spreads the word among the Kickstarter. And uh, and I'll add on to that too. Uh, before I get into the the minimum, uh, I did have an experience with the second having a lower uh, minimum funding with Kickstarter. You, it's an all or nothing. You have to hit your your goal, or you get nothing. If you're a dollar short, 
you don't get any of that money. Uh, so that's something to factor in. Uh, my The standalone expansion, Act 2 for Steal the Show, I decided, because I funded the first one, I want to say it was halfway through, maybe 15 days in. And I did get more traffic once it was funded. So my strategy for the second one was I'm going to lower um, I will lower the goal, I will lower the minimum, so I can get funded faster. Now, I was funded, I think I cut it in half, and I was funded within 24 hours, but I didn't think through the budget. Again, I was thinking about the budget of the first game, but already I was like, okay, I want to upgrade the box. I don't want to have a tuck box, I want to have a two-part box. You know, I want to have a divider. Things I already thought about this aspect of it, but then I didn't think about how that would affect the goal. So uh, I, I raised more money on the first Kickstarter than I did the second. So I, it's good to set the, again, bragging rights. You want to set the goal low, but make sure you set it um, high enough to where you're not, oh my god, you know, am I going to, you know. Well, I, yes. yeah. uh, the key here is deciding what is your minimum product. Yep. So if your minimum product is uh, an illustrated book, like say in an RPG, you have to ask yourself, am I willing to go without pay for this book? Because if, am I willing to go without, am I willing to learn layout software to lay out my own book instead of paying a graphic designer? If I'm willing to do that, then I can set my Kickstarter goal at just paying for the art. Uh, if you're not an artist, presumably. There are some game developers who are artists, and I'm jealous of them. And, uh, well, I, I, yeah, I wish I could draw. But, um, me too? Yeah. Would it save me a lot of money? Yeah, well, I, the, the funny thing is I do practice, uh, and I still can barely make a flower. All right, so, um, anyway, the point is that, uh, so there's, there's this aspect. What is your minimum product? Right. You have to decide what's your minimum acceptable product, and that's where you got to set your beginning. And, and that's that's a great point, because again, thinking back to the tuck box, the mistake I made, and this is just staying true to my word when it came to the Kickstarter, with that minimum, I should have kept it with the tuck box, and then if we hit this goal, then it will be a two-part box, right? In my video, I already had a prototype of a two-part box, and I was like, well, I've seen some Kickstarters where people tone things down, and one, I don't think that's right. Two, you're gonna get beat up in the feedback. Hey, you know what, I backed early, I thought it was you know, a two-part box, and now it's a, you know, a, a tuck box, you know, and uh, which they would be fine with the tuck box, if they knew it was a tuck box. You know? So I was like, well, you know what, I, I said I was gonna do this, so I'm going to own up to it, even if it cuts into the margins. You know, and um, like you mentioned, uh, you can set your minimum if you're willing to learn the graphic design software yourself. Like with my game, the only thing that I did not do was the illustrations. I had no experience with Adobe, but I spent a lot of time on Lynda.com and YouTube. How do I use InDesign? How do I use Illustrator? How do I use Photoshop? You can save significant costs doing that. Plus, you have more. Um, control over the timeline. You want to meet your, your goal, you know, you say, you know, I'm going to deliver in six months. Well, if you have other hands in it, uh, you know, th again, there's uh, a risk of things being delayed. Life happens. Um, so I found that beneficial. So if you can, if you can do that uh, and, and willing to learn, uh, you can save some. So another thing that uh, we haven't mentioned, and I don't know if you're aware of this because you're more in the card game world, but uh, there's a Kickstarter, and I want to say it ended recently, um, Friday, and if it didn't end Friday, it's going on through Sunday, uh, which is we have a new record setting for the largest RPG Kickstarter ever. Uh, and that is an individual named Matt Colville. Uh, when I last checked it, which was like Monday or Tuesday, he had $1.7 million raised. So 20. It's 1.8 now? Okay. Wow. Yeah. Like I said, this was Monday or Tuesday when I was checking it. Um, this man has made a lot of money. He did not expect to make this much money. Um, and part of that is it's not just an RPG book. He is also, he set a goal minimum of 50,000. Now you might say, why 50,000 for a book? Well, the book was actually more of a bonus. 
he is a streamer who does like GM adv DM advice and GM advice and talks in the camera a lot. And he was like, I want to do streaming more full time, and I want to do like a studio, or if it's not full time, I want like a nice rent a nice studio space so I can, you know, cast my D and D games and whatnot. Well, he spent years, literally years, multiple videos a week, just doing DM advice with no ads on the video, like building up a fan base. So when his Kickstarter launched, he hit it in like a, his 50,000 goal in like a couple hours because he had 50,000 fans on YouTube, many of whom turned out and gave a little bit of money. Uh, when you have 50,000 fans, you can have a relatively small percentage of them show up and give you money to hit $50,000. So, you know, that's another thing, building up is, because when you're a game designer, especially a small game designer, you have to wear a lot of hats. You don't just get to wear your game designer hat to where you're making a good game with fun mechanics and it's fun for everybody. You're also wearing the art director hat of the marketing deciding, hat. <laughs> deciding who are you gonna go with art? What should the art look like? Giving feedback on that art. The marketing hat. Also, the face of your company hat. The, the finance, you're the accountant. <laughs> you're, you're, you're a business person, an yeah. accountant. Your accounts receivable and payable and yes. estimates for future products like how much would it cost when I do a tuck box versus a versus a, a, a two-piece separate box? Like, how much would it cost to include, you know, duck? This is all business. Yeah. This is long-term business decisions. What are the expansions? Do am I making this a game line or is this a standalone game and then I'm going to do a separate, different game? These are business decisions, not just creative decisions. You and as a small person, you got to wear all of those hats. I've done some freelancing for companies. I get to wear one hat. Cool, I'm going to put on the rules hat. I write some rules. Uh, I get to put on my game designer hat. I'm writing a module. This is fun. Um, I've been a play tester for, for companies. So like I mentioned, Exalted is one of the games I've, uh, I also I can't remember everything I've play tested at this point. But like, I, I get to wear just my play tester hat. But the person running that game has to think in all of those different ways. Uh, they have to wear all these different hats. Which is uh, part of why a good way to get into the RPG industry is to do it on your own because then once they see that you can do it on your own, then now they understand that you understand how many different hats you have to wear. Um, uh, a lot of people just want to be the, uh, they have this cool idea and maybe they want to do the work of the game design, but the reason why there's a lot of cool projects that we're never going to see the light of day is there's all other kinds of work and once people start actually doing the work, they start to realize how many other hats they have to wear. And it's a lot of time. I think that was one of the first things I mentioned. you got to have the time. And if your Kickstarter is, um, you find that uh, it's, along, along the way, it's going to be, once you hit that goal, and then it's uh, your, not only is it just, you know, pushing with, with the marketing aspect, now you have, you know, now, a small time, I don't have millions, right? I had like, you know, 250, something like that. But now you have people invested in it, and they're giving, you know, feedback, and you, you want to keep them motivated throughout the process. You know, you want them to spread the word to their friends as well. Um, so now, you know, there, there's more time. Uh, I made sure to respond to all messages within 24 hours, really as soon as I could. And responding to those messages, that's time that I didn't account for originally. So, you know, going back to the, you know, the roller coaster aspect of Kickstarter, it's it's time. You, you got to have those 30. I, I don't think I could have uh, launched my Kickstarter if I would if I had a full time job because I was wearing so many hats. I was fortunately to take time off and focus on that. Uh, I think if it was part time at that point, I think I would have stumbled along the way. So, as, yeah, as moderator, I'm going to say we have just about 10 minutes left, which means it's time for audience questions. Um, have you experienced any kind of like other Good question. I, 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 yeah, I can talk to you a little bit about some other projects about because I, as a director, I work with a lot of people who do different manners. Uh, I'll say right now, Indiegogo is a thing. Uh, Indiegogo, uh, the big thing about Indiegogo is unlike Kickstarter, you can opt into getting the money even if you don't hit your goal. Which is part of why Indiegogo has become very popular for charities. 
So for instance, you might be a soup kitchen or whatever. It's like, we want to have a fully stocked soup kitchen at our church. It's going to take $5,000. But if we only get $2,000, still, oh, we still get the money. Um, so you can, you can toggle that in Indiegogo. Usually the reason why, but as a result of that, most RPGs have a minimum. Like, I have a need, like I plan on having $3,000 worth of art, of course the book's just not gonna look the way I want it to. As a result, and because there were some big projects early on that succeeded, a lot more of the, uh, and I'm not using this pejoratively, but rather as a like, I'm like this, like geek and nerd stuff, wound up on Kickstarter more, so that's where the community is a little more. You'll see stuff occasionally on Indiegogo, but really the community on, on Kickstarter is far more geek-oriented, so that's one big thing. Yeah, and, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, and I, I was gonna talk about Patreon. Okay, uh, just one more thing about Indiegogo, um, and I've, I've been on, um, or I've, I've, I've seen, I've been on Kickstarter panels, and I've been in the audience on Kickstarter panels where people talk about the difference of Indiegogo and Kickstarter. Now, I didn't have experience with Indiegogo, you can get that money if you don't hit the minimum, like you said, but when it comes to a game, you have to have a minimum order to get things for now. Uh, print on demand, drive through, that's why they're amazing. You don't have to have a minimum order, but if you're gonna have your game manufactured at a, you know, at a printer, uh, they're gonna say, okay, the minimum order is 500, and that's gonna go into your goal, or you, know, you get the breaks the more you, you print. But I think it's important to factor that in. Now if I need, you know, let's say I need, you know, 6,000 just to get the bare minimum, and if I was on Indiegogo and I got 3,000, well now I'm going to have to figure out a way to deliver to these customers in a different method. You know, it may be a print-on-demand method, and but I promise certain things that I won't be able to, to meet, you know, so, um, so that's... Uh, then you have to go out of pocket for it. Yeah. Uh, so that's one important thing with Indiegogo. Uh, Patreon, of course, is a very different form. It's still considered a form of crowdfunding, but you either get something every month, or you get something whenever you deliver something. So, for instance, it's like, oh, I produce podcasts, one or two a month. So in, on Patreon, you can like check a box where I only pay when you produce something, um, or you can pay every month regularly. So there are some people who are like, one or two podcasts a month, and you pay when I produce the thing. Um, and then people can say, okay, well, I'll, I'll pay a dollar every time you produce a podcast, so, you know, it's one or two dollars a month, you know, whatever. Um, a lot more of the RPG ones I've seen are just like, no, this is it's this much per month. It's, uh, it's more standard. But the thing about Patreon is you have to be producing little things often rather than one big thing. So, for instance, uh, there's a, an RPG producer named Grant Howitt. Uh, in it, he has a handful of like larger, more traditional, you might say, full color books. Um, but what his Patreon is for is uh, if you pay for the Patreon, he does these like really awesome, cute little one-page RPGs uh, that are hand illustrated by him. Like there's little doodles and whatnot in it, and like the game's all handwritten. And he still releases them for free. But if you're on the Patreon, you get them a week early. Um, and some, oh, and on a certain level of the Patreon, you get the other side of the page, in which he has other notes and extra rules and extra stuff. Uh, I got introduced to this at Kanuga, uh, who the game is called Honey Heist, where your bear is trying to steal honey. Uh, you have two stats, bear and heist. Uh, there's little drawings of bears wearing hats on the game. <laughs> I know, it's amazing. So, so, so that kind of thing, he's producing one of these one-page RPGs a month, so if you can't, produce that little bit of content here and there. Even if that content is like a YouTube video, you talk to the camera, it doesn't have to be a one-page thing. It could be, uh, it could be a podcast, uh, it, could be a, it could be a piece of art, depending on the kind of producer you are. Um, if you're not capable of committing to that regular release, whether once a month or once a week, whatever, uh, then Patreon's not good for you. Uh, but I will say that we have, I have seen, I'm working with a number of creators who are moving towards Patreon for a variety of reasons. One of which is the level of fan engagement and the regular, regular income is nice, rather than sort of rolling the dice when your new product comes out to see how much money it gets made. Um, that regular drip of income helps people make bills and pay for insurance. <coughs> um, that regular drip of income keeps uh, them making things like podcasts and whatnot that get them talking to their fans. 
And honestly, a lot of people who were running YouTube channels of like live play or hear me giving you DM advice, and they were relying on the ad revenue of YouTube. Over the years, the way it works, YouTube has chipped away at how much because uh, those YouTube channels, because those YouTube channels are never going to make as much money because role playing is just a smaller, it's growing rapidly, but role playing is just a, a smaller hobby than, you know, movie criticism or whatever. And movie criticism is small compared to other things, funny cat videos on YouTube and whatnot. So, um, you, you, so a lot of people are moving towards Patreon, but you have to be the sort of creator who can always be constantly making a new thing. And I don't think yeah. we, we touched on this, but this is important, and we don't have to spend much time on it. Just uh, consider the fees. Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and I don't have experience with Patreon. Patreon has fees too. Yeah. yeah, so just research the fees and factor that into your budget. And really, that, that's all we got to say about fees, but <laughs> it's a very important. It's another cost. It's another cost yeah. to factor in. It's percentage. percentages, yeah. yeah. Any, any other questions? Um, <clears throat> how do you determine or how do you factor in like the different pledge levels? Because I mean, there's there's certain there's certain projects, especially on Patreon, where it's just say donate what you want to help us stay alive. But then you have like for Kickstarter and Patreon, you know, if you pledge this, you get a T-shirt and poster. And all this other junk. So how do you, how best do you go to you calculate you know, it? You, yeah. you, you, you know, for physical things like a T-shirt, mm -hmm. you, it's one of those things where you got to price it out ahead of time, and you got to ask yourself, what if only one person orders this? Right. Um, that sort of thing. Uh, so, for instance, uh, I mentioned I'm a collaborator, and I've mentioned Tiki Mugs a few times. Uh, so uh, I have a friend who uh, runs Horror and Clay. They uh, make horror-based tiki mugs. They are famous as the original Cthulhu tiki mug. Uh, but he's got their other horror ones. There's a cast of Amontillado. There's, uh, yeah, I know, right? It's awesome. It's a barrel. Um, uh, there's, uh, so there, he's got that. He's got an Innsmouth mug. There's the ape from the murders of the Rue Morgue. But he just finished out a, a successful Kickstarter where he's kickstarting a king in yellow mug. Uh, and I was officially a collaborator because we've been friends for like 20 years and we've knocked around the idea of having a role-playing element to his, his mugs and uh, I was like, oh, I've got an idea for a module, so I was officially a collaborator on that. But uh, to go back to like estimates, so there's one level in his Patreon, sorry, Kickstarter, where there's a special mug. So there's the regular, it's going to be the same cast, the same base of the mug. But there's going to be like a special custom glaze. And already baked into that is only 15 will be provided. It doesn't say Kickstarter exclusive. Because he's already baked into his base number that when he orders these mugs, that he's going to get 15 of these very specific special mugs. It's already baked into his minimum. So when you pre-order, you're just guaranteeing that you get one. So that's another thing. Don't promise exclusive when you're going to sell other ones later. Yeah. That's, um, that's another thing. So uh, there is a whole. Uh, uh, the, so he's up front. He's baked into his base costs 15 of these special items. But if you can pre-sell them, that's better. Um, so it's one of those. Figure out the price. Bake it into your menu. Um, figure out what happens if only one person orders this. Um, and you want to be fair uh, with the with the pledges too. Like for example, a game. Uh, this is a card-based game. You know, about a hundred cards. Uh, Thirty dollars for that is, isn't going to fly. You know, you have to just like any other product. You you research what are other games um, like this um, yeah. selling for, and, and you, then also if you can't be pledge, if you can't be not competitive but comparably, you have to be comparable. Yeah. And, and passionate, right? If you're going to uh, charge a little more, they have to really believe in the cause. Uh, but you want to be competitive. That's uh, you know. ideally competitive, but minimum comparable. Yep. So if you're producing a game where, in this kind of box with this kind of cards with a lot of art, where everyone else is charging twenty dollars, you're charging thirty. You better have a really good reason. Now, like maybe the reason is you have some sort of like well-recognized artist, like. You know, like Brahm is doing a unique painting for every one of my cards. It's like, okay, you can charge them. Okay, like, yeah. but if you don't have a good reason, 
Right. Like it's just like, no, my game design is just so slick. No, no it's not. Oh. There are some, like, <laughs> there's a lot of slick games. Like, there are a lot of slick games. I'm not saying Fernando's not brilliant, he is. But the fact is that a lot of really smart people make games. And a lot of, there are a lot of games that are really fantastic. And if you're going to make me back your Kickstarter, and I do regularly, you have to convince me why I should put twenty dollars for that down rather than another version of Flux. Yep. You know what? Flux is great. Or some, or, or 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 like this is the spaceship version of Catan or whatever. You know, like here's a game I already like. Why should I spend it on on right. yours or whatever? Um, so I believe that um, puts us out of time. I'm just going to toss in. One last thing real quick that I learned at Midwinter, which is retailers. Uh, make sure you have a version where retailers going to order yes. a bundle, especially if you have a Kickstarter exclusive, you want to have a special price for retailers because yeah. you, especially you, yeah. your goal, like I'm a store. Somebody like Fernando needs to be in physical stores yep. in order to sell games. So not only is it in stores, it's in theaters. It actually does better in theaters <laughs> than, it, than it does in That's stores. That's awesome. But, but yes, no, uh, have a pledge for retailers. You know, it can be, you can get 10, you can get, you know, 20, keep it at 10, and then we can talk about more. Um, but yes, that way they get the exclusives if you have exclusives. Otherwise, it's, you know, why do I want to wait for um, the print run when I'm not getting the exclusives? You know, the, you know, the customers already got, got the game with the exclusives. Um, one thing I, I want to say, this will be my, my last thing, is we are running a demo for, for Steal the Show uh, t tonight. It's either 5.30 or 8.30, don't quote me on that. Uh, just look at the plug in. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we'll be running demos. Of course, the, the promo cards are still there, and uh, I genuinely recommend you guys try it. Thank you. Sounds good. All right. Yeah. Good panel. Great panel.